If I am murdered, know I saw it coming. I suspected it, feared it, obsessed over it even. Never had the privilege of being oblivious and carefree. Sure, I could assume that it would never be me, but my demographics don't allow for such folly. I can't sit here as a woman, a black woman, a black Muslim woman, and never consider that I might find my way into somebody's crosshairs. Those are haunting words from Nadira Angel, reading from her blog after the Finsbury Park mosque attack in London and after the murder of Nabra Hassanan in the US state of Virginia. I'm Femi Oke. And I'm Dan Ming. Today, what impact are these recent attacks having on the mental health and emotional well-being of Muslim youth? Ramadan was filled with violence and heartache for many Muslims around the world. Perhaps one of the most tragic of those stories is right here in the United States with the death of Nabra Hassanan. Earlier this month, 17-year-old Nabra was returning to her mosque from a late-night meal with her friends in Northern Virginia when police say the group got into a dispute with a man driving a car. She was attacked with a baseball bat and her body was found the next day in a pond. Her death is currently not being investigated as a hate crime, but many in the community feel otherwise. At vigils around the country, young Muslims shared stories of how her fate could very easily have been their own. On today's program, we'll explore some of those fears. To help us with that, Mabin Hussain, he's founder of British Muslim Youth. Shifa Asun is a student at Temple University in Philadelphia. Fatima Mirza is a supervisee in social work at the Center for Pastoral Counseling of Virginia. And Nadira Anjel is a blogger. Welcome, everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm going to start, Mabeen, with a tweet that I found on your Twitter feed and also on the British Muslim Youth Twitter feed. British Muslim Youth statement on possible terrorist attack in Finsbury Park. Once again, we must stand united. I'm just going to go down here. I've also heard that this individual, the one who is believed to have started the attack, was shouting, I want to kill all Muslims. Mubeen, what is it like to be a young Muslim man in an area of the world where this is how at least one person is thinking? What does that do to your psyche and how you go around and conduct your daily business? I think that's a very important question because, and especially within this conversation, because when you speak to young British Muslims, a lot of the times the conversations they are having or people are talking about young British Muslims, it's always being looked at through the lens of radicalization. And therefore, we're not able to really understand what British Muslims are going through. So, you know, when I turned up at Finsbury Park, literally hours after the attack, I spoke to many eyewitnesses that were, you know, very emotional, that were frustrated and completely traumatized. When Because for them, they had heard this individual attack, in, you know, people. They had witnessed a man being murdered and many injured. And they'd heard, I want to kill all Muslims. But they felt, you know, that they were going to be shut down once again. And it's this issue that young Muslims aren't really being heard when they speak about the Islamophobia, the anti-Muslim hatred that they really face on a daily basis. People shut them down for a victimhood narrative. And, and what does and that mean? What does a lives... victimhood narrative mean? I'm, I'm thinking about young Muslims, like teens, early 20s. What does a victimhood narrative mean to them? What, what does that even mean? Well, a victimhood narrative for young Muslims means that they have to stay silent. They can't speak up. They can't, you know, express the real issues they have. Just as, you know, Nadira talks about in her blog, she says, you know, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. It's quite clear this would happen. But if, you know, after Finsbury Park and after, you know, sadly, and it's shameful after Finsbury Park and after the, the, the death of Nabra, we can have these conversations and people can take them seriously to some extent. I'm not saying they do take them seriously. But we can have that conversation. But prior to this, it's as though that if we ever spoke about these kind of things, and, you know, this isn't the first. People haven't even heard of people like Mohsin Ahmed, who was an 81-year-old man who was walking to mosque and was murdered in Britain in 2015. And it was a terrorist murder. Nobody ever speaks about that. Or the 2013 murder of Mohammed Salim. Now, these are terrorist attacks that have been taking place that have gone on by, as well as other so countless you, attacks. What I hear is that you're saying no one is listening to your voice as a young Muslim. Nadira, you said, if I'm murdered, know this. Do you walk around 
with your little kids thinking you're about to be murdered? Uh, well, I'm not, I don't constantly think that I'm, I'm about to be murdered. That's not something that I could allow into my mind. I have to be able to be present for myself and for my children. And so if I had that thought right in the forefront, it, like, I just wouldn't be doing well. And I always have to make sure that I protect my own, you know, my own mental well-being so that I can make sure my children are okay. But it is always in the back of my mind. And so as, as a Muslim and as, as a black Muslim, this is a feeling that's new and old at the same time. And the reason I say new and old because, I mean, just look at the history of this, this country. Black people have never been fully safe here in, in America. So regardless, Muslim or not, I'm always going to be black, and our history has always been, um, you know, fraught with violence and different things like that. So it's so it's new in that it's fresh, and this is something that just happens, and it hurts. But it's old in that these types of things have have been happening, and we've always had to deal with it. So so on this issue, we got a video comment from somebody in Maryland. Um, her name is Janan. I want you, Nadira, to take a listen and tell me how you would respond. Take a listen to Janan. Whenever I hear about an atrocity that has taken place on Muslims. It puts my life into perspective as to how I have three marks against me. I'm Muslim, I'm black, and I'm a girl. When I go outside, I don't know what's going to happen to me. And I have to think about the time of where I am or the people I'm with because it could determine whether I come home or not. I think that's a real problem and people shouldn't have to have this fear ever. So Nadira, do you have this fear for your children as well? And if so, how do you talk to them about it? Yeah, I mean, she's spot on. I have, I have an eight-year-old daughter and I have a six-year-old son. And so I'm always um, aware of the world that they're in. I'm raising these black Muslim children in a country that hasn't particularly liked blacks and doesn't have much use for Muslims either. But even with that, so I'm, um, we're always aware, like my children, they take karate now because I need to make sure should anything happen, you know, and I didn't just put them in karate, they've been in for a, a year or so. But I want to make sure that they're able to defend themselves. But even with all that, that's, all that's going on, I always make sure they know everything about you was designed specifically for you by God. So we're always going to be, um, we're always going to be happy and cheerful and we're always going to, you're good people, this is what I say to my children, you're good people, you're kind, so that's what you're going to expect back from the world. So even though this fear is there, like I, I am, I'm always aware who's around, what's going on, but I don't want them to walk around with this cloud over their head. You know, I don't want them to feel like, you know, I can't be my full self. As long as God puts air in their lungs, I want them to be, fit, to be free to live their life. And so I tell them, you know, what's going on, we have to be aware of, we have to protect against it, but we'll always stand tall, we'll always be proud of who we are, and there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah, in the U.S. Uh, uh, Shifa, I, I hear you. I'm just going to get Fatima, and then we'll we go straight to you. So hold tight for just a moment. And Fatima. It, when you were talking about the person in the U.K., and you said even one person who feels this way, mm. right, that, that sort of struck a chord for me because I think here in the U.S., during the election, there was kind of a feeling you know, in some parts of the Muslim community that I was in touch with is there, there are not that many people out there mm. who feel this way. But once we saw the numbers and we saw the result of the election, then it became one more thing of, well, one person's speaking out, but there's a whole lot of other people who might feel the same way. And I think that's where some of that um, new awareness of are we really as safe as maybe we thought we were. Mm -hmm. um, and when things like this happen, it becomes a question that a lot of youth ask. It's like, well, one person acted on it, but how many other people think this about me and aren't saying anything? Shifa, go ahead. What were you going to add? Um, I was just going to say that um, I totally agree with everything Fatima and Adira have been saying in the sense that, um, yes, we do feel welcome. And like, for example, in Philadelphia, I was at the, um, the Muslim ban like, protest, and I saw all these different people um, in support of Muslims, and I felt very welcome during that time. But on a daily basis, like when I'm at my university, um, I'll be asked like random questions just on a daily basis, like, oh, like how can you be Muslim and feminist? Or if Islam is, doesn't promote terrorism, well, then why are there so many terrorists? And all these different questions just on a daily basis, and I just find it like um, hard to feel welcome in a place where people just, you know, just ask you these kind of questions. And then on top of that, when you can't adequately respond because 
you know, you may not have all the facts or whatever, people consider you as incapable. And I feel like being, you know, when you wear the hijab or like if you're a Muslim, you're automatically a spokesperson for 1.6 billion people around the world. And if you're not able to answer one question, then it's like, oh, you don't know what you're talking Shifa. about and you're just blindly following. Yep. Shifa, what should they be asking you? Um, if you could school I mean, them, what, what would you suggest? I would say that definitely ask questions. I'm not saying like don't ask questions because all the all my friends who aren't Muslim, like I totally support them like asking questions if they don't understand. I would just say that, you know, the way that you're asking makes all the difference. So instead of asking like what's that thing on your head, which I've gotten multiple times, maybe like um, you know, you know, that cloth that you have around your head, or maybe just do some research and find out like what that cloth is called. Like we live in a day and age where it's really easy to find out information and I feel like just people sometimes are ignorant and they don't choose to yeah. um, all those questions she for they're asking they you they could google all of them really easily <laughs> really really absolutely. easily <laughs> absolutely exactly Dan. right so i want to bring uh, Mubeen back into the conversation we got this tweet here from altaf he said the focus on muslim youth is too often from a security lens we're calling for a more nuanced approach to understanding their lives. So Mubin, you touched on this earlier, but I want you to, to elaborate. Do you agree that there's often this focus on security when it comes to Muslim youth and not about the, the texture of their lives? I, I completely agree. It's something that I've been actively opposing, advocating against. I've, I've said it for a long time that, in fact, I've said it in government circles and they say, well, this is a very ridiculous way of saying it. And I say, well, it's a ridiculous thing to do. I've said that we've got such a microscopic vision on the Muslim community that if one of us fought, you guys would smell it. It's because that's how the Muslim community is viewed, that every inch of you know, life that, 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 that takes place is assessed. Every Muslim is almost on a daily basis, on examination, you know, as, as Shifa has actually uh, argued. I think what we have to realize is Muslims are part and parcel of society. You know, young Muslims are like anybody else. They are struggling through education and university, struggling to get on the housing ladder, struggling to find their way in life, find a partner, find, uh, you know, that where they want to be, like any other young people. In the UK, young people are, uh, mental health issues within young people are rising, suicide rates amongst young males are rising. And on top of that, young British Muslims also have the added pressure of being the most discriminated people within the workforce. In fact, the Women's and Equalities uh, a Select Committee in Parliament found this. And they said, in fact, if you're black or and a woman and a Muslim, you fall under the section of what they call the triple whammy, because you will be discriminated three times. A, for your sex and your gender as a yeah. woman, B, for being a Muslim, and C, for being black. And this wow. is the reality Triple that British whammy. Muslims and Muslims around the world are facing. Using the vernacular to, to describe a, a whole series of prejudices and biases there. Fatima, as a counsellor, you have lots of Muslim clients who are coming to talk to you, some young people as well. What are you finding uh, issues that actually have a theme and maybe relate to this idea of, of li living in a stressful time where people are... Uh, either seeing them as violent or violence is committed uh, against them? Almost every single one of my Muslim teens has basically said that at some point they have been bullied for their religion or for their ethnicity. And it's been fascinating to see the different ways that people are able to cope with that and to figure out how to um, reclaim their identity in a way rather than letting it be rewritten for them by the media or by people who are biased against them. And the more that they're able to have spaces in which they can do that and to be really honest about what their questions are about Islam um, and to be able to get those answered, then the more confident they feel uh, that they can make it and that they can, you know, decide how they want to be presented to the world. What are their coping strategies? Because I know that sometimes you'll be walking around and you will overhear things. You overhear what, for instance? I mean, I was standing with my supervisor. We were in the middle of um, a hallway in a large apartment complex. And somebody walked by and, and made a joke about, oh, we shouldn't congregate here. Um, and the way that it was said kind of made it sound like they were expecting me to do something in that mm. apartment complex. Mm. And the, the fact that it's passing and that people keep going and they kind of, ha ha, that's a joke. Um, but in some ways it's not a joke and it's not funny and it's, it, it leads people to have that sort of ambient anxiety mm. about, am I really seen as a legitimate 
part of the community. What do you do? What, like, if you could replay that moment, yeah. what would be the best way to deal with, is it a joke, is it a not a joke? It's basically aimed at me because I'm a hijabi. Yeah. I mean, and that's where it's complicated because you don't know the person who's making the joke, right? Are they quite with it? Would they become violent if you said something? Is it best to handle it with a, with a joke yourself? Is it best for the non-Muslim person standing with you to be an advocate? Um, and, and you really just sort of have to feel it out and then yeah. find a place to process it. Yeah, yeah. So just on this issue, we got this tweet here from Tell M-A-M-A UK. Uh, it says, we cannot underestimate online far-right and anti-Muslim networks that feed dangerous misperceptions about Muslims. Um, Shefa, I wanted to ask you this. You know, aside from these more overt forms of discrimination that we see online, um, talking about the more subtle forms that you just mentioned, Fatima, what responsibility, Shefa, do you think non-Muslims have in these situations? Yeah, so I would say that um, it's definitely a great thing that they're asking questions to Muslims because they're, if they're not sure about something. But I think beyond just asking questions and clarifying things for themselves, it's also a duty upon them to go ahead and educate other people, um, educate their friends and educate their other family members who may not be as open to um, or accepting towards Muslims as they may be. So it's also on them to, to pass that on because if we just stop um, at the front level, then the message of Islam won't get spread across to like other people as well. So it's passing on the knowledge that they get from their Muslim friends to other people who may not know. Guess or, who, or who may not want to listen to Muslims. If I can, yeah, sorry, yes. if, I, if I can just come in there. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Um, just uh, responding to that tweet, that tweet was done by Tell Mama. Tell Mama are the anti-Muslim hate crime monitoring organization within the UK. So they report and they monitor anti-Muslim hatred within the United Kingdom. And just an interesting fact they found was uh, just before we had the Manchester attack where Ariana Grande was performing, uh, a week before the Manchester attack, the first, the seven days before, there were 25 Muslim, anti-Muslim attacks on Muslims in the UK. The seven days after, Tal Mama's reports found an increase to 141 incidents of anti-Muslim hatred. This mm. was a similar increase we found in London, and this could be one of the reasons why attacks like Finsbury Park happened. Because right. whether it's in America, whether it's in around the world, whenever these attacks happen, Muslims across the world, and especially living in non-Muslim societies, find an increase in anti-Muslim hatred towards themselves. Mubin, you bring up a really good point, because with all of this anxiety and some very real fear here, uh, Aman Ali posted this on Facebook. Aman Ali is a comedian, and he was saying at the end of the holy month of Ramadan, there's this amazing festivity called Eid. It's a huge party, but many parents and many families were scared to go out. So Aman Ali posted on Facebook, he says, I will come to your party, I will make your party, I will bring my goofy mum. Here he is telling us about how he came up with that idea. So on my Facebook page, um, a lot of people were commenting saying, hey, for Eid, uh, I don't feel safe uh, taking my kids or I don't feel safe going myself because of, you know, what's happening across the United States, across the world with all these, you know, hate crimes and terrorist attacks against the Muslim community. And I understand that. You know, I can't be like, oh, you're blowing this out of proportion. Like being safe is such a fundamental thing that and if you don't feel like you have that, you'll do whatever it takes. But I just got so sad because the little kid in me was thinking like, man, what would it be like to not have Eid, to not be able to celebrate? So while I understand and respect why people didn't want to go to Eid, I said, okay, what can I do? And I thought, hey, why don't I just bring Eid to people's homes? And so I literally went on Facebook and posted a goofy photo of myself I'm like, look, I will bring you to you. I will video chat with you. I'll read a story. Um, I'll tell stupid jokes. I'll juggle if you want me to. Uh, message me if you in a, if you want that to happen. And so it was cool. Like, we got uh, maybe like half a dozen, maybe actually no, about ten or so. Uh, people reach out. And it was fun. Like my mom and I, we sat down. Uh, we took some time out of our day yesterday on Eid uh, to record, and we just started uh, video chatting with a bunch of random families we didn't know. I didn't know who any of these people were, but it was cool. Uh, and again, it won't help you forget what's happening. Uh, but even if you can take a pause to just laugh and smile, I think we all kind of need that right now. So anything I can do to do that, uh, it's a very good feeling and a blessing. 
All right, so that all made us laugh, okay. So we're thinking coping strategies, counseling, how do we help each other? That was an extreme version of how you help somebody, totally in the spirit of Eid. Um, I don't think it's that extreme. I think that Tell me why. In, in times like this, we reach out. Right. And it's that connection that helps us get through uh, the situations that sure. we're in. And actually, that's why in community level trauma, that people are less likely to develop extreme reactions is because we've got people ah, to talk to about it. Right. And if we do respond to that opportunity, if we do create those spaces, and we have, for example, blogs like yours, you know, we have a space to have that conversation, and then we don't feel alone, and we can process it together. Yeah. Nadira, I also um, don't I think I, I didn't know that you are teaching your kids karate. Right. That is a whole level of coping strategy. Like, no one's going to mess with your kids, right? Right, right. right. Shifa, mm -hmm. what's your coping strategy? Um, yeah. Oh, I was just going to um, ask Fatima, actually. Like, sure. as a youth, um, as a youth, like a Desi youth in the Indian uh, family, um, I know, like, myself and other people um, actually have a hard time dealing with mental health and just the taboo around it. Like, for example, with all these traumatic incidents that are happening, I know, like, personally, friends have told me that they can't go to their parents or they can't go to people because um, the idea of mental health or depression uh, doesn't exist in in certain cultures. And so, like, if we need help as a mental health specialist, like, what do you suggest that we as youth do, as educators do, as adults in our community, like how do we deal with the situation when there's no place for us to go to? I think it's really tough because I feel like the people who are in university or who are young professionals, they really get counseling. And a lot of the parents, of especially immigrant youth, they don't get it. And so we do a lot of education for the different masajid or mosques around this topic. And for people who are in a situation in which you can't find somebody to talk to, um, that's where some of these online resources become helpful. Like there's a, a website called Stones to Bridges, um, and they have a live um, place where you can submit questions and mental health um, professionals who are Muslims will respond um, and provide a preliminary guidance. And a lot of universities also offer um, places to go to talk in the counseling center and, and those kinds of things. And then we're also happy to come out and do workshops. So there's a website in the DC metro area called Muslim Counselors, and there's a bunch of us that are listed um, on that, and we're happy to do those kinds of outreach for you. Fatima, do you think every mosque should actually have a counselor attached to a mosque? I, I sincerely believe that there needs to be a robust um, set of resources. It doesn't necessarily need to be at the mosque, because sometimes people's dirty laundry then becomes public and mm -hmm. you don't really want that to be <laughs> sure. the case. Um, but there needs to be places where um, people can feel like they can refer to individuals that will respect their culture, respect their religion, mm -hmm. and really be able to provide services that are competent in those areas. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I would like to add to that. I think it's extremely important for Muslims to be able to step away from the idea that um, there's this thinking that like, oh, you're just not praying enough. Or like, you know, if you're mm. feeling like you're sad or you're depressed or anything like that, oh, you're yeah. not praying enough. Or praying you need to... isn't counseling? Or can praying be counseling? It certainly can be. And there mm. are people who pray and feel like, okay, I'm good and I don't need anything else. Mm. And for that person, that's excellent. But for there's another person who's literally up praying all night and they're like, I still need something else. Yeah. But they feel like, but if I were to go to an actual counselor or try to do something else, well, then does that make me a bad Muslim? Because, you know, because mm. people are saying that I shouldn't do that or this, this shows that I'm um, weak in my man and my faith and so um, it's, it's more of a discussion that I'm seeing starting to happen where people are, are being able to say you know what you can pray you can do vicar you can do your remembrance of a lot and you can also see a counselor or do anything mm -hmm. else that you need to do go to dance classes if that you know if whatever that helps you or whatever mm -hmm. it is but yeah. it's possible to be both and and you don't have to feel like doing one negates yeah. the other mm -hmm. I, I like the karate yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to wrap this up and with a tweet from um, Hanif. He sent us ideas. He said, solutions, clinicians being available to serve youth, support groups, town hall meetings, self-defense classes, and consistent prayer. So those are just some ideas we got. I feel it's appropriate to end on this tweet. And this particular picture here from Omid Safi, he reminded us to remember Nabra. Remember her life, her light, her activism. Don't reduce her to vicious violence inflicted on her mobilize.
Hello again. We are discussing the impact of recent Islamophobic attacks on the emotional well-being of Muslim youth. I want to get right back to that conversation. But with a young woman who you may remember, her name is Suzanne Barakat. In 2015, her brother, her sister-in-law and another young person were murdered in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. A year after that happened, this amazing young woman, the sister of the brother, did a TED talk. This is the TED talk. Islamophobia killed my brother. Let's end the hate. I want you to listen to a little bite of what Suzanne had to say in this TED talk. Just a couple months ago, Khaled Jabara, a Lebanese-American Christian, was murdered in Oklahoma by his neighbor, a man who called him a filthy Arab. This man was previously jailed for a mere eight months after attempting to run over Khaled's mother with his car. Chances are, you haven't heard Khaled's story because it didn't make it to national news. The least we can do is call it what it is, a hate crime. The least we can do is talk about it because violence and hatred doesn't just happen in a vacuum. So, if a crime happens to a Muslim, is that always Islamophobia? Is that hate crime label, is that critical for what? and how people process what's happening right now, Mabin? Does it I matter? I think what we have to... I think it, it, it matters 100%. Uh, I think, as I say, when I turned up to Finsbury Park, the anger wasn't, let's call it a hate crime, let's call it terrorism, because when many of these acts are politically motivated, it is also terrorism. And, and, and this duplicity that if it happens to a non-Muslim by somebody who professes to be a Muslim and has political ideas, therefore it can be terrorism and the opposite way around. It is not terrorism. It's very important. In an era when we live uh, with media sensationalism, headline, 24-hour news, uh, and especially how the type of media we have in the States, I think labels are very important. And this, this is one of the reasons why the Finsbury Park attack was seen as so significant because it was seen as one of the first times Muslims, um, in the murder of Muslims done by a terrorist was called uh, terrorism. And this is important. Mohsin Ahmed, I mentioned earlier, was murdered uh, by somebody who had all the indicators for radicalization and terrorism. It wasn't called terrorism and nobody remembered him. The mm -hmm. same happened to Mohammed Salim. No, nobody remembered him. And the same with Chapel Hill to some extent. I remember speaking at a vigil in Chapel Hill, but there wasn't an outcry throughout the world as there should have been. And sadly, that is the same thing what's happening with Nabra. It's when it's, when it's being called a hate crime, people think, oh, it's less than terrorism. Somehow it's okay to have a hate crime on Muslims. It's like a normal murder. We need to understand that the hate crimes and the way it's happening on Muslims, it could and will, if it continues to go in the way it is through the rhetoric, it can lead to genocides like we saw in Srebrenica and other genocides previously. So, Mubin, we got this tweet here from Tasneem in Scotland. She said, we need to challenge anti-Muslim hate groups through our and through our criminal justice system hold individuals accountable for inciting hatred. And then she followed up, she said, those who incite hatred and divisions and such as far-right groups need to be held accountable by the law. Um, but Mubin, would you agree with this? Is this what needs to happen and can it happen when you're talking on the level of speech? Okay, so, I, well, I think it looks about, I had this conversation, uh, I was speaking at a news gathering conference for ITV, where it produces from different uh, channels within ITV with there, and we talked about the That's balance one of the between big, freedom and tolerance. It's the, one of the big national channels in the United Kingdom. One of the big national channels in the United Kingdom, um, and this was a debate we had, and many of you guys may have heard of the hate preacher Anjum Chowdhury. He was somebody that used to be given a red carpet on UK, and even he's been on something like CNN and Fox News as a hate preacher. He was given a red carpet to go out there and speak for Muslims and, and, and come out with his hate speech. But after a while, we learned that this type of terrorism would continue if hate preachers were given a platform, and the importance of not platforming, for platforming them, the anger from the Muslim communities. And we learned from that. With far-right extremism, we haven't learned from that. In fact, in the UK, we put Tommy Robinson back on our TV screens. So I think there is a level where we need to understand there is freedom, but we can't allow you know, uh, that open space for hate preachers to go out there. In fact, uh, unfortunately, he's now uh, the president of the United States, but you know, he also has a platform. Those in the UK maybe aren't too fond and, and don't want him here, but he has a platform in the United Kingdom. 
uh, say in the United States, and he's pushing out a lot of stuff that is causing negative effects uh, on people in America. But That's I think right. there needs to be definitely a line. Yeah, for, from my perspective, a lot of these um, situations that happen within the Muslim community, and I'm sure it's the same within the, the broader African American community, is that when incidents happen, we hear about them much more than they're reported in the me media. Mm. And so when we see 35 incidents that have happened and only two have made it to the national media, really our interpretation point. of whether or not there's hatred out there yeah. is going to be different than the average person sitting at home in front of sure. the TV. That makes um, a, really, that's a, a really good point because um, Suzanne, who I just played that little clip from the TED, TED Talk, she mentioned a story that probably most people would never have heard of, which was a hate crime, and he only served eight months in prison and came out and did it again. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to remember, and it's such a great point, that your reality is different from the mainstream media reality. And I, I'd like to add, um, like what Mubin was saying, it's, more, it's important for um, when things happen against Muslims, for them to be characterized as acts of terrorism. Mm -hmm. because it, Terrorism, not hate crime? Because I said, what about hate crime? And then maybe he's like, no, 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 no. He's, he upped it. He's like, not hate crime, it's terrorism. Well, I, that means that every act of violence against everybody is an act of terrorism. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't I, I, I didn't quite say that. No, no, I'm, okay. I'm saying that. I am saying that. I know what you said. Well, I think, I think hate crime, me too. I think hate crime, too. Yeah. And that's not to say that anytime something happens to someone who is Muslim, it's automatically a hate crime or act of terrorism. But when it is that, it needs to be characterized as that because for so many people, especially people who are not Muslim, don't know a lot of Muslims, you know, mm -hmm. don't really have that in their inner sphere, the only time they hear the word terrorism or even think of it it's is when it has to do with a Muslim doing yeah, something. And yeah, so then yeah. when something happens to Muslims, yeah. it's harder for them to even humanize it because they're like, well, mm -hmm. they're always, you know, they're always killing people all the time. They're always committing acts of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And they don't, you know, they don't even think to associate that word mm -hmm. with what happens to us. And so that's like, there's a divide. They're not seeing, okay, these are all, you know, human beings. They're looking at like, well, that's them over there. And, you know, they commit terrorism all the time, so deal with it. It's also, as a non-lawyer, there's this difference, I think, like terrorism is often seen as something that happens by people who are not from here. Mm -hmm. And hate crime tends to be things that happen amongst Americans, yeah. right? Yeah. And so when you characterize somebody who's Muslim as a terrorist, you're also in some way also saying that they're foreign. And so there's this implicit sort of pushing that narrative that we're not really from here, mm -hmm. that we're not really part of the society, you know. Zara. Uh, Baloo is the executive director at the Council on American Relations. This is what she says. Brothers, sisters and cousins, tell me during times like this, what would make you feel safe? There's some interesting responses to this. Let me show a few of them. Uh, pepper spray. You talked about pepper spray. Yeah. <laughs> not, not just any kind of pepper spray. You actually gave directions as to what kind of pepper spray to get. Yeah, because it's a full conversation we had and we were talking. This With was your right. girlfriends? Yes. And we were saying, like, man, you know, this was right after we heard about Nabra and everybody was taking it hard. And we were like, man, you know, we need to get some pepper spray and we need to get a gun, but how safe is the gun? And then uh, one of my friends... Well, so, like, slow down so where, where are you having this conversation where you're talking about we need to get a gun? Yes. Where, where are you? Oh, where? Just with different people. I've okay. had this conversation with my husband. I've had this conversation right. with um, different cousins and friends that I have. Right. That's, that's really serious. Uh, Shifa, for you, what would make you feel safe? That's what Zara was asking. What would make you feel safe? I think it's just creating a space for like us Muslim youth that we can go to in times of, you know, whenever there are violent attacks or just in general when we feel like, you know, that we're, like, we don't know what to do. Like we, if there could be a space where we can just go to and talk to people and say like, hey, I'm going through this and I need help because it's, it's not really that popular, especially in the community that I'm from, that you can't just go out and be like, hey, like I'm having these issues and I really need someone to help. And then also just letting other youth know that, you know, that you matter. And I know that some people of my friends have expressed like, just wearing the hijab makes them feel very nervous and like they feel like they're an open target just for wearing it. Mm -hmm. And so it's just empowering our youth and letting them know that, hey, like you matter and that you belong here and that you're completely valid, like you matter. Just and letting people know that. Yeah. Marie, let me share this with you from Shakespeare. He says, start a campaign where they can fundraise money to purchase tasers, stun guns, self-defense classes, 
weapon licensing for Muslim women. And then another people, another person, Justin under here, talks about non-violent communication that helps prevent altercations from happening in the first place. What would you add to that list? What are you talking about as young British Muslims to help you feel safer? Well, before we add anything, uh, mm. as, as somebody from the United Kingdom, we have anti-gun laws. We're proud not to have guns in this country, so we take out all forms of guns, uh, and that's something part of our culture here. Guns aren't something that we support in any way possible. I know there's a difference in the United States, and I respect that opinion there. Yeah. But I think more than anything, it's to challenge it where it is. You know, we we need to challenge individuals who come out with certain type of rhetoric and perversions of Islam. But likewise, we need to ch challenge far right extremism. Not be given the platform. We need to challenge Trump when he comes out with the you know the U.S. ban and then the Muslim ban across the world. We need to challenge people who somehow think that we want to. When you say I want to kill all Muslims. Is that only hate crime because you want to kill Muslims? Or when you kill white people, it's not hate crime, it's terrorism. You know, we need to challenge the ideologies that are growing. There is an alt-right, there is a far-right extremism that is growing throughout Europe, within the United States, and, and within Britain. And more than anything, I think we need to challenge those ideologies. We need to challenge those rhetorics and make sure they're not acceptable. We're hearing about young children going to school, listening to Allah Akbar and explosion sounds, uh, you know, being challenged. Uh, young, young children, you know, are facing this. And you know what? If we don't deal with it now, in the next 10, 15 years, as this grows you know, um, further, it could get far worse. So more than anything, tackle the ideology, call it out for what it is, and also call, hold the authorities to account sure. where they don't tackle it. All right, Shifa, Mabin, Fatima, Nadira, really appreciate the insight into your everyday reality as you're living it right now uh, in the United States and in the UK. Dan. So I'd like to end with this video comment we got in terms of what kind of support that could be offered. It's from Christina, who's executive director of the Muslim Community Network in New York. Take a listen. We have to create and nourish support systems for Muslim youth and other youth who are mistaken to be Muslim so that they are equipped to process and heal from tragedies that strike close to home. These support systems need to have a holistic approach, such as including mental and emotional support like counseling and techniques for handling stress, as well as opportunities to empower them to make positive contributions to their communities, such as through community service activities and opportunities to help the people who are most in need in their communities. And that wraps up this episode of The Stream. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guests, for being part of this conversation, our online community, and everybody watching. Until the next time, we'll always be online. Hashtag AJStream. Take care.